Welcome to Wednesday, June 30th. Uh, oh, these are not our office hours. That was the other sheet. It's our class session. I did take some notes in the office hours, very short notes beforehand, and uh, might as well show them to you, but they'll be posted later because someone was asking a question about how to graph in Desmos heavy side function. And so I put a Desmos demonstration. You can actually follow this link of me graphing the heavy side function and the solution from the homework you handed in last night in Desmos. Desmos is a great graphing tool. It's just not going to check that we did any differential equation correctly. It's just going to graph whatever you tell it to graph. And you can graph step functions and things like that. Okay, you'll find that note on our website under office hour notes. Oops, let me get someone else in here. Okay, we've got a lot of people sitting in here and we got everything connected. So we can't ask for more, so let's get going. Uh, remember that exam three will be released tomorrow night by 11.59 p.m. That is July 1, so tomorrow is already July. Your summer is going. We are officially in summer, of course, because it's past June 21. So tomorrow is July, and that's when your exam is gonna be released. Exam three will be due by 11.59 on Tuesday, July 6th. And uh, I think I only put that in there because when I set this whole thing up at the end of, or when this whole class was set up, I thought, okay, class ends July 1, we're okay. But then I realized I'd have to give you an exam at the end and that exam would cut into July 4, so. Here's one extra day. Enjoy yourself a little bit on July 4. Uh, today's topics, I want to do one more problem where I do some advanced constant juggling just to show you. That's what I call it. I don't know if anyone else calls it that, but the prepping of your transforms to be decoded. I called it in my videos and presentations so far, constant juggling. So let's do a hard one. Then we're going to bring up convolution, which is kind of theoretical. So it's going to be a theor mostly theoretical presentation today, but I have an exceptional practical example prepared for you tomorrow. So, because often your statement, even from the very first math class you took when you're instructor would not let you write 3.14 for pi or 1.41 for the square root of two. You know, you've been fighting this idea of, I want to approximate and the instructor says, no, you're not supposed to approximate or the instructor says, okay, it's okay to approximate here. But that is, uh, it is a serious issue when you can approximate, when you cannot. And you can quite rightly say to me, well, Dave, when I go out into the field, I'm gonna just be measuring and approximating anyway, right? Well, you're, you're absolutely right, but you're measuring and approximating real physical phenomena. And from our work, you understand that the differential equations that we construct have unique solutions. So there is, there is one solution out there, even if you're only approximating it. And the problem is you need to know that you're approximating it well. So if your little brother, or little sister, cousin, whatever, came up to you and said, what's wrong with my math problem here? And then you look at the first line, they rounded off square root of two to be 1.4. And then they did some more calculations with that. And then they rounded off again. And then they got down to the answer and they rounded off again. And they're surprised that, you know, their answer is, you know, 15 units different than the truth. Well, you, you explain to them what? You shouldn't round off in that way. You don't round off at the intermediate steps. You didn't round off and bring enough precision. 
you know, you give them all kinds of examples and, and uh, illustrations that maybe they can consume and maybe they can't consume, right? But you have to be careful when you're approximating things. So I'm gonna show you an interesting example tomorrow that would be real life from an engineering point of view. Uh, then that's also under convolution, but you're gonna to have to pay for it today. Our discussion convolution today will be tending towards the theoretical. Uh, I love giving fun or silly analogies. So today's fun or silly analogy was produced in the office hours. So I apologize to anyone who was in the office hours and has to hear this analogy repeated but I need you guys to dive in and you're diving in and sometimes you just need to dive in a little bit more into the mathematics of things and things like that. This is not a statement about any one person, but I do get regular emails saying like, oh, I tried to do this in mathematics and it didn't work. I tried to do this in mathematics and it didn't work. And let's resurrect the greatest hitter in the history of baseball who's since died Ted Williams, right? And if you don't like baseball or you don't play baseball, then I'm sorry. Give me your favorite domain and I'll make up a silly analogy for it for the next class. Silly baking analogies. I love baking analogies. <laughs> but anyway, let's dig up Ted Williams from the grave and you walk up to Ted Williams, greatest hitter in the history of baseball. And you say, oh, Mr. Williams, I just can't, the splendid splinter. That's what his nickname was, very thin. I can't hit a curveball. I can't hit a curveball. I can't hit a curveball to save my life. And Ted Williams, very knowledgeable, would give you some advice, some general advice. Like, well, you know, okay, make, you know, make your stance like this. Keep your shoulder up, uh, you know, open. I don't know anything about hitting a baseball. When I was playing baseball, I was a pitcher and pitchers notoriously can't hit. So, and, and then you would, and, and that would get you so far. You might get a little bit better, but then Ted Williams would invite you to the ballpark and say, well, come and watch our game tonight. If you could make it to St. Louis or was it Boston? Goodness. I, I'll be in trouble if I don't remember that. Come and watch our game tonight. You know, watch me hit some curveballs in batting practice. Watch our game. Watch me hit in the game. You would watch Ted Williams and you would get better. And it's the same thing. There was an interview recently with Akil Badu from the Detroit Tigers, a rookie from the Detroit Tigers. And, you know, everybody say, wow, he's got skills. He's got hitting skills. And in the interview, Akil said, well, I watched a lot of old film of hitters hitting. Watch a lot of film. Yes, you would get better. And that's about the same way as you watching me doing problems or executing Mathematica. Now, if you really want to get better, thank you, Red Sox. Ted Williams would say, you step into the box. Let's have someone throw some curveballs at you. Let me look at what you're doing. And then in an instant, he would say, you're dropping your shoulder. You need to choke up. Your bat is dropping down too low. Your feet are out of position. He would just, well, if it was me trying to bat, he would just rip me to shreds but he would tell me what to do. He would show me what to do and I would probably get better. Not major league better, but which of those three ways of getting better is gonna do you any good? You wanna to listen to me talk about Mathematica? You wanna watch me do Mathematica? No, you need me to watch you do Mathematica. You need me to watch you hit. So. I respect all your emails. I love all your emails. I'll help you every time as much as I can, but sending an email that's saying, I didn't get Mathematica to work, that does not feed the bulldog. Please, and I know you have other constraints about working conditions and things like that. Send me the notebook. 
send me the notebook, okay? Because then I can help you advance much faster. Now, I only meant that to be humorous. I did not, that was no way of criticism because you guys are doing good jobs with the notebooks. But you wanna know how to get better faster, then let me watch you hit. Got it? Okay. So let's, this is gonna be extremely dangerous, but let's just invent a problem, second order problem, and let's not try to cook it. You know, when, I'm, when the math professor says I cooked this problem up, what they mean is they prepared it so that it would be like simple to execute. So let's not give you a problem that's been cooked. Let's just make up a problem where the constants are gonna be unfriendly, possibly unfriendly, and let's just live through it. Oh, there's, there's a question about the homework that was submitted last night. Uh, no, I, I'm halfway through reading those and probably this afternoon I'll get them posted and I'll also get the solution posted so you can go to the solution. But I think I'm halfway through the group and I'll get those posted and notify you when they're posted later this afternoon. Okay. Uh, but yes, you can always monitor the Google Drive. But uh, yeah, let's let's write down an example where things are not going to be nice. Because that's what you would say to me if I tried to tell you to stop approximating or stop rounding off so much. You would say something like, but Dave, when I go out in the field, these uh, numbers are not gonna be nice, like four and three and two and one. You're absolutely right. But you could still work with the exact numbers. The only, let's, the only slack we're gonna cut ourselves is the one agreement I've made to you that I will let a machine perform partial fraction decomposition if it ever comes to that. But everything else, including the constant juggling, let's just take it. So, I'm going to, let's invent a problem. Do we want underdamped, overdamped, critically damped, or uh, undamped? I don't think undamped is exciting. I think the worst kind of pain is gonna happen when it's underdamped, because that's gonna be sines and cosines happening. Uh, so let's think of an underdamped thing without pretty numbers. So how about y double prime plus, oh, I'll get really nasty, make this an odd number right here. Three y prime. <laughs> yes, if we were in the classroom, I would take numbers from the floor. So if someone suggests a number from the floor. I'll tell you what though, whenever and you should check this out whenever you're in a classroom. Whenever the instructor usually says, I'll take numbers from the floor, they usually get these crazy, crazy numbers that make the problem really, really bad. And I have no problem with that. But I say to that, I'll use your number if you let me use that number on the exam. And then people get a little more mellow. So yes, pi would be cool to bring into here. You want me to bring in pi? We'll bring in a pi on this side. So uh, this is gonna be, I think, this looks to me like underdamped oscillation. I'm pretty confident of that because I'm gonna be shy of that five. Okay, so now let's talk about a function like, well, let's put a constant function on this side. And then let's take a step function minus three times u at two <laughs> times. <laughs> I'm gonna get the pi in there. Just relax. I, I forgot I had unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and how about? Uh, Yes, sine of 
pi times t minus two. And what the heck, then let's give it a kick, an impulse at four seconds. So I don't know if this is a real world problem or not, but okay, it could be. I think my instinct tells me I've made something too obnoxious, but we're gonna find out. Uh, let's, let's not get crazy with the initial conditions then. So let's not try to, we've already made ourselves enough trouble right now. So what do we got here? Constant function, and then have uh, turning on at two seconds a sine wave whose period, observe, is two seconds. Two pi divided by pi period. I'm sorry, angular frequency. Well, the period is two seconds, that's right. It's gonna shift to two seconds, then I'm gonna give an impulse. So I am not gonna commit to what this looks like, but. I just want to feel what this looks like. It's going to be four. And then it's going to subtract three copies of a sine wave. Now this three would be the magnitude of the sine wave. So that could possibly be up to seven down to one, but I don't know if it connects there, right? So I'm just going to say sine wave. And that sine wave doesn't ever stop. They didn't turn it off. Do you see that? I didn't turn it off. But at four seconds, I gave this thing a punch. So that, that does not show up in the driving function, by the way, because the driving function, this is zero all the time except for that punch. So my, here's my driving function in a raw way. Constant sine wave goes on forever, but there's been a hole punched in it at four where I give the impulse. So that's what I'm feeling about my driving function. So now let's go do the differential equation. So uh, what color should we use? So I am going to, because I have a feeling this is a mess, I am going to accelerate some of my work right here. So you know that if I had filled in the blanks here, I would have 3s plus 5 ly. But I'd also have to pay for it with some initial conditions. So from this piece, I'd have S squared minus an S Y naught minus a Y prime naught. So S Y naught would be subtract S one. So subtract S. Subtract Y prime naught would be subtract negative one, which would be plus one. And then from this piece, I will have to contribute something for the Y prime I'll be subtracting y naught, but modified by that three. I'm writing too small there. So I, I'm allowing you to fill in some blanks. So three y naught, subtract three y naughts. Subtract three y naughts is subtract three. There is no adjustment made from this piece of phi y. Okay, so now I have applied the Laplace transform all the way to the left-hand side. Let's apply the Laplace transform to the right-hand side. Well, the Laplace transform of four, I'll write it because it's in several pieces. So that's four times Laplace transform of one. Subtract three times the Laplace transform of u2 of t sine of pi t minus two, at least this has been shifted and delayed for me. Okay, so we made a little bit of cut right there. And then the Laplace transform of delta of four. So it's a little bit crowded, but now let's bring it together. Equal sign over here. Negative s minus two, I bring to the right, s plus two. Uh, now I start writing four times the Laplace transform of one is four over S. Laplace transform of this, I get a minus three, then the second shifting theorem, shift and delay, and E to the minus two S because of that delay and shift. So 
I want to take the Laplace transform of, and I'm going to fill in this blanks just so you can write it again, pi t. So the exponential envelope and the Laplace transform of the untranslated object here. And here is 2e to the minus 4s. That's the Laplace transform of the heaviside function. There's just a the wrapper waiting for me. I know the Laplace transform of this object is sine. Now remember, this will be s squared plus pi squared. Remember, you asked for the pi. And on top will be a pi. I'm not afraid of that frequency of pi. This constant of pi, OK, it's going to make me do a little work. OK, so now let's write the final, the final finished right-hand side s plus 2 plus 4 over s minus 3 e to the minus 2s pi s squared plus pi squared plus 2 e to the minus 4s. And that is equal to just s squared plus 3s plus 5 ly's. So I think this is going to be some constant juggling here. I could bring this quadratic under each term here. And notice I got four terms right there. So let's do that. Advance the paper. Number the paper. L of y equals s plus 2 over s squared plus 3s plus 5. I'm going to complete the square on this because this is an unfactorable quadratic, and that 3 is going to cost me 4 over s, s squared plus 3s plus 5. This is going to be partial fraction decomposition, and I'll have a quadratic term that can maybe merge with this quadratic term. We'll have to see how nicely that comes out. But this is partial fraction decomposition. Then, whether the three goes inside or outside, see, that's a matter for personal taste. I will put it inside. And I've got an s squared plus pi squared. But I've also got an s squared plus 3s plus 5. That is going to cost me. The only thing that here is not as threatening, paradoxically, is this 2 over s squared plus 3s plus 5. Because that's just a simple no uh, partial fraction decomposition required. I brought the 2 inside. Uh, it's going to be treated similarly to this one. Here's the partial fraction decompositions, and this one looks like it's got some work to it. So I think a good way to do this, well, let's do the partial fraction decompositions and then decide what we can gather. Do you notice, and some of you do this, and I don't mind, you could gather these two right now into one fraction. I would just multiply top and bottom by s. Then I'd have s squared plus 2s plus 4 on the top. Now that is not wrong. But usually, so you'd be making something that looks a little more complicated. And I don't know if I want to make things that look more complicated. Right? That's a good tip. So let's treat these four entirely separately. And that's, and I might need several lines to do that. That's why I'm underlining them. And then we'll bring them together later and see if we get good answers. So let us prep one. It's just good practice to prep this. So here's where the pain's going to come in s plus 3 halves squared 
that'll give me S squared plus three S's plus nine quarters. And five is, sorry, I should keep that visible for a while. Five is 20 quarters. So nine quarters will be 11 quarters shy of five. So now you see that my omega is root 11 over two. And I have an S plus two here. Now I have to break this down. I need to make an S plus three halves match. I need to make a omega match possibly. So I write this as S plus three halves, but that's one half short of two. So I need to add one half, but I also need to have a root 11 over two up here on top. So let's get the root 11 over two up there. And I cannot add these, that won't give me two. So I need to turn this into one half so that when I add it to that, I get that. That does not look terrible. Multiply by one over root 11. So this is prepped. It really is in two pieces. This is a cosine transform. We'll even write it down. This is a sine transform. But the reason I'm doing this, I want to illustrate this, is so you think very methodically like this. And notice the shifting by three halves. So this comes from e to the minus three halves t cosine root 11 over two t. This comes from one over root 11. And here's my omega up here. This is a sine transform, but I've been shifted e to the minus three halves t sine root 11 over two t. Now I would call this advanced constant juggling. I would call this medium difficult constant juggling. I don't think it's gonna be compared to what we're gonna see right there. But I have decoded the first part of the answer. See, I have decoded number one here. Now let's look at number two. And so I think I'm gonna pull up a Mathematica notebook and maybe you guys have already decoded that one. Let's pop down a little bit. I'll just keep this open as a tiny window on my space so we can pop back to it if we need it apart. Uh, what do we got here? Four over S, S squared plus three plus three S plus five. Got it. Is that legal? Not the right number of braces. Yes. That's a minor syntax error. So Mathematica says, four over five S minus four over five S, I'm writing this on the paper, plus 12 over five. Now, that's not the way Mathematica wrote it. I got my S squared plus three S plus five, which I'm going to write as a difference of two squares. This is 
not, you see the result of Mathematica and it tends to put fractions into the denominator. I don't want to do that because I want to focus on my core, what my fractions look like in Laplace thank transforms. You. There, thank you. So I wrote those fractions up here. I'm going to do one more check to make sure I wrote it correctly. Oh, okay. This minus sign, remember, belongs out front. So these both negative here, but we can manage that. But I think I wrote it correctly. Okay. Am I on the right page? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just reading comments. Where do you want me to invert the sine wave yet? That that was from earlier. Never don't worry about that. Oh, okay. That was your little sketch up above. Yeah, there there's a minus sign coming in here, but right there. Maybe that mindset. Okay. <clears throat> so now here, let's prep this. And this is why I want to keep the four fifths separate. I want to think of this as four fifths times one over S. One over S comes from one. So when I decode this, this is just four fifths. Now I got to set this up. So I need an S plus three halves to appear. Oh, you know what? Maybe it would be nicer if I pulled that four fifths out front like Mathematica did. This is gonna take me a step, right? That leaves me an S plus three, S plus three halves. Sorry, gotta move the paper up. Squared plus five. Got it, no, no. 11 over two, four. That's a little bit messy, but we'll rewrite it. Now I can, break this S plus three into an S plus three halves plus three halves. So S plus three halves squared plus 11 fourths. Now I want to have a similar term right here. S plus three halves squared plus 11 fourths, but I want this to be three halves on top to make that three. But I don't want three halves on top. Technically, I want a root 11 over two on top. So how do I turn, this is how you think, how do I turn 11 over two, root, root 11 over two into three over two? I multiply by three over root 11. And it's always good to check this out to make sure you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. Right, so I had my four fifths factored out, give me an S plus three. I want S plus three to be the total on the numerator. There's S plus three halves and that's plus three halves, that's S plus three. I think it's good. Now we decode. So we are still writing our solution if you allow me to write it in pieces like this. So now we're gonna pick up a four fifths times one. I'll just write four fifths. I've already commented the fives and S's look alike, so keep them straight. Here, and notice this four fifths is on both of these pieces. So first, minus four fifths. This is a cosine transform that's been shifted with an exponential. And the frequency is root 11 over two. Then I throw that four fifths onto the 311. So now I got minus 12 over five root 11. And this is a sine transform, e to the minus three halves, t sine, root 11 over two. Okay, got it. I think that's good. So we're preparing the solution in parts. I think we've come to the nasty one. Let's find out how bad it is. Maybe it's not bad. And you say you'll never see a problem like this in real life. Well, I'm not so certain. Okay, so let's get this 
back to my Mathematica notebook. Let's get the partial fraction decomposition out. And that would make this S squared plus pi capital PI squared. Got it. And what was on top? A three pi. So always make sure you typed what you thought you were gonna type. You typed what you wanted to type. I'm missing a, see, whenever Mathematica has these braces or parentheses or anything in red means I'm missing a pairing. So I lost that pairing right there. Now all brackets, you see how all brackets are highlighted in fact, the shades of green are even different. And Mathematica is pairing all the brackets with you except for these inner ones. So it's just pairing the one I just typed. If I put my cursor here, it pairs these two. If I put my cursor here, it pairs these two. Okay, and I'm inside the apart command, so it pairs the last two. Let's see what happens. Whoa, I knew that was a mistake. <laughs> Okay, what part of this do we recognize? <laughs> that is our unfactorable quadratic. That is a horrid constant, a couple of constants, another constant coming down here, another constant coming down here. I'm glad I tried to try to do that by hand. So we're going to decide right now what to make of this. Mm. What if you factored out the three over 25 minus pi squared plus pi to the fourth? That, that would be one thing. Let's call this alpha or something. Right. But then I'm, I'm even looking at these that I'm not happy about. Yeah, those aren't pleasant. So let's think about this for a second. You know, this could be... Uh, beta and a beta minus nine pi. No, this is not. This may not even be a wise use of time. You know what happens when you invent a problem that you don't want to do? You change the problem. So how should we change this problem? Let's make the pi one. <laughs> Could do that. I don't object to that. Uh, but that would allow me a lot of rewriting. I sure. think what I'm going to do is can the whole sine wave. Now you say you're cheating, and obviously I am cheating, because now this is just 4 minus, or sorry, 4 plus an impulse at that point. But I have some things swinging over. I've already done some constant juggling. You know, if you want to do the problem yourselves with a one instead of a pi, I don't think that would be terrible. I'm scanning here, one, one. Maybe I should accept that suggestion. Yeah, we're in fear. We're in a fair time right now. I think I'll accept that suggestion. Who was it that brought the pie? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I I apologize. You should never you should never do problems cold, right, on the fly. So I should have cooked up a uncooked problem, right? But let's track track this. I don't think that's a bad suggestion. Change the pie into one because it's not going to do much damage. Do you see that? I'll just write a one here. Let's write a one here, this will become a one and a one. I don't think I'm damaging any of the other pieces. There's a one and a one. This becomes a three times one and a one. And I think, and then I started decoding these pieces, right? So you do want to experience this third piece. Okay, let's experience the third piece, but. Let's replace the pi with a one. What will that do to my drawing here, right? That'll make, 
if that's a one, now the natural period is two pi. So it'll be the same kind of quality, except it'll be like stretching out the sine wave. So that's a good question too. So here we are, and let's go back to our Mathematica sheet and let's get into here and let's change the pi into one. And then let's see that magically this becomes, oh, just medium bad. Okay, let's write this one down. So I have, but this time I'll do as Mathematica said and keep the minus 325ths out front. I'm writing it down, then you can read my paper. 3s plus minus 4. It's too close. S plus 1. And then plus 325ths. Pull the 325ths outside of the whole thing. 3s plus 5. I wrote that way too small, but we're going to be writing it again anyway. S plus 3 halves squared plus 11 over 4. So before I commit to the paper, let me just, um, you're, you can view my paper as you like, but I'm just making sure that I wrote this down correctly. And we're in a fair time. So I don't mind doing this like this. This is good practice. Okay, good. I think we got it. So I'm going to go back to the paper. And I did write too small, but now let's clean this up. Now you guys are going to get very fast at this, right? So watch. The 3s minus 4, you've now learned this game, is going to likely split into two waves. And on top, you just want an s because there's no shifting going on. You can park the three out front. And here you need to have minus four, but you want a one up there. You can't deny that. So how do you turn a one into a minus four? Multiply by minus four. So this is prepped. This is ready to go. Now you said, well, that was easy because I didn't have to do any shifting. Now you could still do the same thing right here. Let's try it. So let's think about this. I want to probably break this into two waves. Squared plus 11 over 4. S plus 3 halves squared plus 11 over 4. I'm writing that too small, but we are repeating it. Now, what do I got here? I got a 3s plus 5. I cannot put an S on top of here. I must put an S plus three halves. But I must have three S's. So I park a three out front. Now I got three S plus nine halves. Now what is five? 10 halves. So I got to make up one more half. But I must have 11 over two here. So how do I make 11 over 2 equal to 1 half? I multiply by 1 over root 11. I did write that too small. But you have my written notes too. Now let's just see that this is what I intended. I will have 3 s's plus 9 halves plus 1 half is 3 s plus 10 halves is 3 s plus 5. And that's what Mathematica charged me with creating. That's what it was. OK, so now we're doing this. Uh, what do we got going on right here? Now we're ready to decode that. So this is going to be one, two, three, four pieces. Here's some exponential shifting inside there. These are just raw ones. Let's combine the constants where we can. So remember. <laughs> Don't forget that this is wrapped in an exponential. Uh, can could you, could you say that again? I didn't hear it. I said, just don't forget that this was wrapped in an exponential. Yes, that's good. Yes. I so didn't want you to lose that's it. That's going to be there. Right. So let's not rush to the solution. Let's first just figure out what this part is. 
So I'm going to say minus 9 over 25. And this is a raw cosine wave. No problem. This is plus 12 over 25. This is just a raw sine wave, frequency 1. Now here, I got plus 9 over 25. This is an exponential of minus 3 halves t times a cosine wave, but this frequency is root 11 over 2. And this is, my, is 3, 1, 25, 11, plus 3 over 25 root 11, exponential minus 3 halves t, sine wave with a frequency of root 11 over 2. Now, this question came up a while ago when I used the word frequency right here. I'm referring to a number that's in front of the t in the argument. So this is by default angular frequency. Even if someone says frequency, that is angular frequency. OK, good. So you're comment was, now I need to shift and delay. And now you see what that's going to cost us to delay, to replace every t with what? Every t has got to be replaced with a t minus 2, like it was here. OK, I am not entirely sure that we're going to get this on one line, but we'll keep presenting. I can break it into two lines. So this piece shifted and delayed. So first I'm going to have this delay of two seconds. Then I'm going to open up the big brackets and write minus 9 over 25 cosine shifted two seconds plus 12 over 25 sine shifted two seconds. Good. That's that part. Now this part, let's gonna go down here because it'll get rough room. Now this is what? Plus nine over twenty-five e to the minus three halves t minus two cosine. Now of course this is extreme. But I just want to show you, you could do it. And if you really want some fun, you could have numerical solving for Mathematica. And then if you really got nerve, you could type in this thing that we're creating, as we did yesterday, and see if it matches the numerical solver. And when it doesn't, you track down the errors. OK, did I shift and delay? No, I did not shift that one right there. Shift, 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 delay. I think we're good. But there's more solution to come, just as there was more solution to come up there. Uh, that was the beginning of the solution right there. We're doing very good, and then we're going to take a break. So. Let's decode the fourth piece, which I told you was going to be a mellow one by comparison with the third piece. Think about doing that with those pies in there. Let's get this numbered. Let's get the fourth piece back on the screen in front of you, kind of. There is no partial fraction decomposition do here. All we need is to prep this 2 and then shift and delay it. So 2 over s3 halves squared plus 11 over 4. That was going on throughout the problem, so I'm grateful that you know that wasn't changing. And guess what? There's no s up here, right? So this is not going to split into two waves. One wave will do. This is what? A sine wave. No s present. And when I juggle the constants, it will not add an s, right? So let's go straight for the constants. 
I want 11 over 2 on top. Square root of 11 over 2. I have a 2 on top. I have to make them the same. So you can see that I need to multiply by 4 over 11. Don't do anything fancy. Just figure out how to make a 2. OK, so that is what I need to shift and delay. Oh, wait a minute. I have to say where it came from. Then I'll shift and delay. So I'm going to shift and delay what? 4 over root 11. Let's be consistent with that green that I used previously. 4 over root 11. Uh, just a sine wave, but an exponential wrapper on that sine wave. Is that good? Got my sine wave, got my exponential shift in here, got my constant, good. Now I shift and delay. And this should be the last piece of our answer. Which is shift and delay plus u sub. It was still shifted. Oh, what, what's the shifting here, right? What's the shifting here? Four seconds, because this was a tap, an impulse at four seconds. All right, so I'm going to put four seconds right there. And that affects what I write in here. Four over root 11, exponential minus three halves t minus four sine root 11 over two t minus four. Stop, 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 solution. Okay, so we are about to take a break, but let's just summarize because this, this would clearly be the worst case scenario among the worst case scenarios. I guess I could only make it worse by including a pi. I have an Underdamped oscillation. So that's going to produce sines and cosines right here. Unfactorable quadratic. And I have a constant, a sine wave, but in the middle of the sine wave, I punch it with a impulse, a double strength impulse. I mean, we haven't really talked about the strength of impulses. I encoded it in Laplace transform language. Yes, encoded it in Laplace transform language. So all these four pieces, we made the pi adjustment. And then we broke these four pieces down. This one was not so bad. This one was okay, partial fraction decomposition. This one didn't even require partial fraction decomposition. This one was a little bit messy. So my solution is gonna have four pieces. You know, literally what I'm saying is that they're the inverse transform of each of these, right? The book does favor this language inverse transform and I don't mind it. I don't, and get used to it if people say inverse transform to you. I think it's also simple to say this in English. Where did this come from? When someone wants you to integrate something, right? Aren't they just saying, where did it come from? So. We, I have not used extensively the inverse Laplace transform language, but they're just saying decode it. And they do use, some people do use an L inverse like that. So we decoded it one step at a time. Got it going on. Uh, notice in steps one and two, as we said, there could be some bringing together since these are the same exponential cos waves, exponential sine waves, there could be some bringing together there. So our solution isn't as long as it looks. Yes, you could label that like that. That's good. And then this one was a little bit messy. And then this one was mellow. Could I bring these two together? The answer is not really because they represent different times. This action takes place at two seconds. 
and everything has been shifted by two seconds, this action takes place at four seconds. So these two cannot be combined. Okay, so what are we gonna do right here? I don't know, this was, this would be, this would be a, I would be willing to call this a very difficult problem, a challenging problem. You know, uh, a mean homework problem. Probably a little bit mean for a test, but for a take home test, maybe not. But really what we're doing is uh, we're all just, this is all just bravado unless I check that this answer actually works, right? So let's take a break. You take a break. I think I'm gonna try to type this in to Mathematica and then get Mathematica to do a numerical solution and see if they match. Because, you know, what good is it if it's not correct? So that'll take me a few minutes to type. Let's say, let's come back at uh, 104. Then we'll show you that graphics. Then we'll open up convolution. Okay, you take a break, stretch your legs. And I will investigate this in Mathematica.
Okay, we're back, uh, back a minute late, and we're almost got this whole thing typed in. So why don't we just go to that screen and see what happens? Of course, I haven't had ability to check that. And this is very small type for you. Looking at my monitor. Let me see if I can improve that type slightly. I think I improved that type slightly, but that damages readability. I'm here in the very last piece of that, and it's complaining to me about lack of parentheses. So that fixed that. Lack of parentheses, that fixed that. But this last term I have to correct. You can try to read what I typed in case you see a mistake. Two, but we'll read it together once. T minus four, X T minus four, and it could still be wrong, right? So I see some mistakes that I'm gonna have to correct. This is T minus four. This was wrapped in a square root of 11 over two. Okay, we could, no parentheses errors. We could possibly read this. Let's see if we can read it and see just what happens. Okay, so this was my first term of one with the square root of 11, sorry, over two is my argument. Mathematica interprets the fractions in line in a logical way. It doesn't say I'm dividing by two t here. Then I did a plus one over root 11. This was the next piece. So from here to here is solution number one. And from here to here is solution number two, four fifths minus four fifths exponential cosines Subtract 12 over 5 root 11. That has to be in parentheses. Exponential signs. Got my arguments correctly in there. Okay, I like that. Copy. Now let's go to third piece. Was the first heavy side part. So this was the bad third piece. Heavy side t minus 2 minus 9 25 straight cos plus 12 25 straight sine. Then plus 9 25 exponential cosine, but this needs a frequency in here. Got it. Got it. And then the sine wave likewise needs a frequency of root 11 over 2, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Got it. Root 11 over 2. Got it. Whoops wrong side of the square brackets. Good. So this is the third piece correctly, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's look at the fourth piece. Uh, Fourth piece was shorter. It was a heavy side at t minus four, four over root 11, exponential, but shifted four seconds. Sine wave, same frequency, shifted four seconds. I think that we typed this incorrectly, but we'll never know until we work it out. So what do we got right here? Notice I had already typed in the forcing function up here. So I could simplify this by just typing f of t. So now forcing functions f of t, my solution's capital Y. Here's the problem, y double prime, three y primes, five. Initial conditions, one and minus one. This would be the moment of truth, because when, did I hit enter on this button? Okay, when I hit enter, I'm supposed to see things line up. Now let's prep this a little bit. This 
is the numerical solution. Actually, it's an exact solution, which might cause a problem for Mathematica. We'll have to see, because this was messy as an exact solution. But I also want to draw, besides that, I also want to draw the driving function. And I want to draw my solution. So that's a list of computer solution, driving function, my solution. Then let's decorate these so I can tell them a plot, uh, tell them part plot style. Uh, and it's not enough to say light gray, black, blue. Let's make the blue, we showed you this trick last time. Let's make the blue dotted. Who knows what's gonna happen? Notice Mathematica is thinking hard. And that's because I asked it for an exact solution. This was a messy problem. Whoa. Okay, so we do not have a solution, but something is, you know, we might be able to hunt down the errors. First of all, let's remove the driving function because that's distracting us. Oh, the next thing I'm gonna do, let's do this. I'm gonna change it from D solve to N D solve. I'm gonna tell Mathematica just do this numerically if it's hard for it to do it exactly. But we can go back to D solve in a second. Okay, specified range, not specified range up. Okay, that means I have to change these parameters right here. I have to tell it where to solve it numerically. Let's say minus one to 10. Mathematic is giving me a warning that uh, at negative 1.99, something went wrong. But I'm more interested in this graph. This graph tells me I am not too far from the truth. Because I see the impulse at four and I see it settling into a sine wave. It looks like of a good frequency. The problem looks like I went north between two and four and Mathematica went south. David? So do I have a minus sign? Yeah, I think there was a minus sign in the original problem. It Good. was a minus three heavy side theta right there. Which we copied here. Did we incorporate it into our Right, well, But I don't know that you incorporated that in the solution. Okay. I, have track written, I wrote a minus sign in my notes, but. Good. Now let's track backwards because that, that's what the, the picture says to me. A minus sign is missing. There was the minus sign in the original problem copied, used here. Now in part three, did I do that minus sign? I'm wondering if I didn't. I'm, I'm thinking not. Because I think you three, only, because if you had done the minus sign, the first term should be positive. It should be a 9 25th. Right, and because this was the result of the Mathematica. Right. Partial variety composition. So let's, it's always dangerous to experiment like this, but let's change that section to have a minus sign in front of it, which is not hard to do. And then let's see if we get better. So that section was the heavy side section right here. So let's just stick a minus sign instead of a plus sign. Try again. Whoa. Show us Mathematica. Oh, sorry, sorry. Then I just ruined all the drama. How about that? You were correct. There was a minus sign I should have incorporated into that answer. Now I got everything going. Uh, I'm gonna make it even more dramatic. Let's go for 20 seconds. Let's put the driving function back in, in black. Let's expand this window to eight possibly. Oh, I got to go out to 20 seconds. Look at that. That is beautiful. So for the first one second or two seconds, I'm trying to imitate four for two seconds. 
but my initial conditions threw me downwards and I were trying to recover to a constant. So I'm trying to imitate this constant, not be that constant, I'm trying to imitate that constant. But by the time I start to level off, the sine wave kicks in and I have to do oscillations. But before I even do a quarter of an oscillation, I get hit with that delta function. Now that delta function is not reflected in this forcing function here because it's just for a moment infinity. So I get a small kick there and then I resolve myself to following the driving function for the rest of time. That worked out nicely. We didn't do a bad job except for a one minus sign. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Uh, let me take off the driving function so we can concentrate more on the qualities of this function from zero to two. I'll remove the driving function. I'll remove the black indicator. Yeah, that looks like, you know, this is only a numerical checking, right? Because it only looks like my solution matches the numerical solution. And remember, this is Mathematica's numerical solution. The Mathematica is relatively reliable. Let's take off the numerical solver and say to Mathematica, I want an exact solution. Notice how Mathematica exact solution is spinning for seconds. That was the equivalent of you and I doing it for 40 minutes. You want to see the exact solution. There's the exact solution. Now Mathematica will write things in the way it pleases itself. So our exact solution is much friendlier than this. But Mathematica organizes its pieces in the way that pleases itself. I don't think that's useful. You couldn't compare your exact solution to that and see if it made any sense. I'll go back to the numerical solver. Notice I took the semicolon off numerical solver. And so the output of numerical solver is this. The output of numerical solver is a report to me that says, I did succeed in finding a numerical solution. It looks a little bit like that. And if I want more details, it used the Hermit method, which I'm not familiar with. And there are many, many methods. I could have, didn't use the Euler method. And then uh, onward like that. Okay, so if you needed that information. I am not quite, oh, here's, here's, let's go back and decode this error. See, it says input value minus 1.995. See, something is going weird at minus 1.995. So if I just had done this minus one to 20. Oh, okay, so the numerical solver worked from minus one to 20, but I told it to graph from minus two to 20 and Mathematica is complaining that it doesn't have data there. Something is going wrong. So if I told the numerical solver to work from minus two to 20, would that fix the problem? Yes. Okay, but that's more information than you need. Okay. That was fun. But we got to move on to our theoretical discussion. So, I mean, consider that to be, you know, serious challenge. That problem was a serious challenge, but you could make it match. You could even graph this graph in decimals, by the way, but you can't have it check whether it's differential equation actually solved by this. Here we're checking a solution against a known solution for Mathematica. Okay, let's get out of there. Let's go back and have a fun discussion. So the question is, where do we want to have this discussion? thinking whether I want to do this on paper or on the board. I'm thinking about what I want to present here. I kind of like the written notes, so. Let's stick to the paper. 
But that was fun. Uh, got some other error reports from the group that the Mathematica server may not be up right now. I will investigate that as soon as I get out of class. The server is run in the back room by the IT department. I do not get to touch that server. So whenever you see a down report to me, I report it to them. They generally fix it quickly, but it would be better if it didn't have a problem, right? Okay, let's shift gears. Now we got to shift gears from extreme numerical to a little bit theoretical. Where is our paper, by the way? In our cheat sheet of Mathematica, or cheat sheet of our cheat sheet of the plus transforms. Let's dig that out of a folder in my desk. We've done pretty well. This is really, of course, this is a brief introduction to Laplace transforms, but we have done everything on this page, except for the very last thing, called convolution. So that's where we're gonna start now. And I have to give you some examples and a, a really beautiful example prepared for tomorrow. So what's the purpose here? We know we love that the Laplace transform, and let me speak very, very generally here. I'm, I'm speaking in a qualitative fashion. I'm not going to put every variable down here. If I have two functions, f and g, we know that the Laplace transform of f plus g is Laplace transform of f times, or plus Laplace transform of g. We know we love. Love is not even a strong word here. We depend on this. We really, really like this property called linearity. But it's clear that you can't take this too far. So what if I had a plus transform of f of t times g of t, you might wish that it was the Laplace transform of f of t times the Laplace transform of g of t. But you know, if only from your sheet that that's ridiculous. Because, for example, the Laplace transform of t squared is clearly 2 over s cubed even if only from your sheet you know that, but you know this, you could execute it. Laplace transform of e to the 3t is one over s minus three. And that is definitely not, sorry, move the paper up. That is definitely not the Laplace transform of t squared e to the 3t, which we also know by heart from our paper as two over s minus three cubed. Not in any way, not in any universe are these the same. Not the same function. So it looks like we, you know, you could just like shrug your shoulders and get over it. Like, okay, I can't do this with multiplication. But then say, well, I wish I could. Well, wishing doesn't make this true. But now let's go back to your vector calculus analogy. You learn to add vectors. Let me use pointed brackets for vectors. 3 plus 4 plus 1 
plus uh, negative two plus seven plus zero. You learn that to add vectors, you just need to add the slots. So this is an analogy. And you would call this one, 11, one. In fact, you would call that after some experience, you would call that obvious. You would say to someone, there's no other way you could possibly add two vectors. But if you wanted to multiply two vectors, should you multiply each slot? It sounds logical at the beginning, negative 6, 28, and 0. But even why it might be logical, and even why some people could try to make it work. The question is, does it do anything arithmetically useful to you or geometrically useful to you? And the answer is no. In, in, in the final analysis, this didn't even make any sense to multiply each slot. I mean, you could play with it, but it just doesn't get you very much. So someone came up with a different idea. Why don't I multiply each slot and add them together? So that the multiplication of these two vectors is now called 22. Now this had its own problems in that uh, usually when you multiply two animals, you want another animal back, right? Like three times two is not dog. Three times two, the number three times the number two is the number six. Here I multiplied a vector times a vector and I got a number. That's a little bit disconcerting because like add vector plus vector, I get a vector back. I wish I got a vector back, but I didn't. Is there any other, so this is not like multiplication the way you and I know it. So you had to stop, you had to not call this multiplication. You had to give it a fancy name. You gave it the name called the dot product. And you could say that what's better about the 22 than the minus 6, 28, 0. But in calculus, we don't have time to relive it entirely. This 22 did things for you. This 22, by the way, told you that these two vectors uh, differ by an angle that's greater than 90 without even drawing them. The fact that the dot product is positive meant that the angles were more than 90 degrees apart. In fact, that 22 and a little more calculation would tell you the exact angle between those two vectors. Now, do you care that that 22 is not a vector anymore? No, you don't, because it does something useful for you. If it does something useful for you, you're willing to forgive the fact that it doesn't look like what you thought multiplication should look like. That's a key idea. It doesn't look like what you thought multiplication should look like. Okay, now let's go even farther. If we, if we were to totally relive this, the fact that I could define angle like this in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, or five dimensions meant that this dot product actually, in a way, transferred all of geometry from two and three dimensions where you normally do it to any dimension, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera. So this dot product turned out to be very powerful, even though it wasn't multiplication the way you thought it should be. Of course, then you invented the cross product, which was also equally useful. Okay, so the reason I'm doing this to you is to make you say, Just because the multiplication you wanted to do did not work out, that does not mean you can't do something else useful. That's what I want to do up here. The multiplication I wished would happen clearly does not work. That does not mean I just walk away. So let's try to see if we could invent a multiplication that would make this true. That would allow me to do that. Instead of calling it the dot product, what we're gonna call it 
is convolution. And we're going to use an asterisk or a star. OK, that's the motivation. That means we can actually get going. So that's the basis of this theoretical presentation. So since we not multiply in plus transforms. The way we wish we could And by the way, just because it's the way you wish it doesn't mean it should happen, right? Maybe is there another multiplication? That we could invent instead. And by the way, there's another logical trap here. Maybe we can invent another multiplication. But if it doesn't do anything, then it's just like a theoretical exercise. The dot product was not a theoretical exercise. It actually did something for us. So we have two challenges right now. Can we create a multiplication that would work in this sentence? And is it of any value? Let's call this proposed multiplication because we've cheated, we've read the end of the book and we know how the story turns out. Convolution, and you'll see why people pick that word in a few minutes. Notation, people commonly use for convolution is star. So can, this is the problem restated, we invent a multiplication star. I have to say multiplication in the very loose sense of the word, not the multiplication we're expecting so that the Laplace transform of F star G is the ordinary multiplication of the Laplace transforms of F and G. Now the star belongs to the functions. This is a multiplication of functions. It does not belong between here because I want this to be the ordinary multiplication of rational functions that I like, you know, rational function of S, rational function of S multiply. Here's our question, here's our challenge. And like I said, we've read the last page in the novel and the answer is yes, we can, but we have to do this carefully. So let's look at this like this. I know the definition of a Laplace transform of F is zero to infinity, F of T, T to the minus ST, DT. In the shorthand, we called this F of S. I know, we need another color, that the Laplace transform, we'll do a little bit of color coding here, of G of T, is the integral from zero to infinity, g of t, e to the minus s t, dt, which for shorthand we called capital G of s. So I want to know what happens when we multiply them together. Try to keep up the color coding as long as I can. 
because it's a little bit useful. I could write these two things next to each other. Here's an expression. Here's an expression. This is what it means to multiply them. But I would like to mingle them. And the problem I have mingling them right now is that I'm using the dummy variable t in both cases. Now remember, I've already given you this speech. I don't care what variable I use for the dummy variable. But if I slam these two together right now and I read a T, I'll be nervous. Am I talking about the T that's working over here? Or am I talking about the T that's working over here? So here's a sneaky trick. Why don't I change the dummy variable in there to V? And you really cannot protest at all. I just changed the name of a variable. Why don't I change the name of the dummy variable over here to U? Of course you say, well, okay, I don't mind, but you didn't do anything. I agree, I didn't do anything yet, but now, that I've got these instructions the same. Now in calculus, there was a fancy name for this, but there was also a lot of rules associated with this too. So I'm not gonna relive the rules, but what I'm about to do is something you might look up in a calculus book. Legally, it's called Fubini's theorem, but Fubini's theorem legally did not deal with improper integrals. So I'd have to do a whole limit analysis thing like that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna smash these two together and say to you that I'm doing the integral from zero to infinity, from zero to infinity, two integrals on the real line, one double integral in the plane f of v g of u and combining the e's same base e to the minus s v plus s u this is s v s u Well, you've seen me factor that out before. Common S, common minus sign factored out leaves a V plus U. And then DV DU. Okay, good. So the question is, sorry, I gotta move my paper up, my fault. Let me tear this off. We're doing good for time, but we're doing a theoretical discussion now. We don't get a lot of practical things in here yet. Yeah, so the, so the question is, am I just dancing around with colors? Right? So where else can I take this? Now I want to do a little drawing on the side because I am doing an integral over two variables. This is a double integral. This is an integral in the plane. So if I think about the domain here, I've got a U variable and a V variable, right? And I'm integrating the U variable from U to infinity. I'm sorry, I'm integrating V from zero to infinity. I'm integrating U from zero to infinity. So I am in this integral, think back to your double integral days, I'm integrating over the whole first quadrant from zero to infinity in both directions. There's nothing wrong with that. You've done such integrals possibly in Calc 2. It's, it's legal. I'm sorry, Calc 3. It's legal. 
But if I want to hope to make something useful out of this, I got to rearrange it. So I'm going to do a variable switch. What color should we use for the variable switch? Let's see if orange shows up. Let's let orange is showing up. Okay, not excellent. Let's let T, let's go back to T equal V plus U. I won't use that orange, sorry. Let's let T equal V plus U. And let's replace the V in the problem with T minus U. And I just want to look at V and T right now. So let's just say I'm holding U fixed. I'm not looking at U. Just say U is a number, U is a constant. <coughs> let's replace every V with T minus U. In some places that is very simple to do. So I just say T minus U, G of U. What that does is it does relate this F and G a little bit. That's one of my motivations. What does it do here? That even makes that look easier. E to the minus S T. In a way, do you see where I'm headed? I'm trying to head back to recover the Laplace transform. Let's go over here. Now I'm not doing anything to the U. So let's let the U be left alone. But what should the DV become? Well, DV DT, if I differentiate this, DV DT, V is T minus U. So DV DT is one, just considering them as variables. So DV is actually equal to DT. I've almost finished everything, but now I got to do the limits. Now the first limits are the U limits. That's the zero to infinity on the U limits and U I was not changing. But V goes from zero to infinity. So I changed the V into a T. So if V is zero, what is T equal to? U. And if V is infinity, what is T equal to? Well, U plus infinity, whatever U is, it's a real number, that's infinity. So now I've done something, but I, and I, I'm aiming for Laplace transform, but I'm gonna make one more sneaky thing. But, but first I have to make a chart. What did I do in terms of variables? I went from U and V to what? U and T. And in fact, I am not covering the whole plane anymore, the whole quadrant, because U does go from zero to infinity, but T only goes from U to infinity. Now, if you sketch that region, T equals U, like here, would be this line, t equals u. And for every u from zero to infinity, I will go from what? u to infinity. Now this might have to wake up some of your Calc 3 multiple integral knowledge, but these limits create this infinite triangle on the first quadrant. I'm still doing two infinite integrals, right? But just my starting place has been shifted from that axis to that axis, to that line. Now I do the truly sneaky part. So let's get both these on the screen at the same time. 
This is also something you did in Calc 3. Change the order of integration. I want to make this look more like a Laplace transform. So I want to integrate ultimately with respect to t. I want the t integral to be last. So how could I change the order of integration? It doesn't change anything I do in here. Those are still the integrand. It changes the limits, right? So let me write, yeah, I'll keep the black. F of t minus u, g of u, e to the minus st. But now I have to change these limits and I have to look at this triangle. So where should I let the t's run? The t's should properly run from zero to infinity. I'll draw a new triangle right here. I still got that same border. I'm still dealing with the same region, but my t's will run from zero to infinity. But now for each t, where will the u's run? Zero to line, zero to line, zero to line, zero to line, zero to line forever. Your first reaction is, who cares? Now this line, remember, is u equals t. So I'm going to let each u run from 0 to t. Your first reaction is, who cares? You just change the limits. Ah, but I did win one victory. I am now looking here at a finite integral that only deals with u. I cannot remove this t from this integrand because it's tied to the u, but this I can remove. So watch this. Zero to infinity. Now the color coding is important again. Zero to t f of t minus u, g of u, du, stop, e to the minus st dt. This, if you look at it carefully, is the Laplace transform. Sorry, shift paper up. The Laplace transform what? Isn't this, this is how you do Laplace transform. You put a function e to the minus s t dt from zero to infinity. This is the Laplace transform of something But this something we've never met before. Take a moment to look at it. It's a finite integral from zero to t. The variable of integration is a dummy variable u. So think about what I just wrote in red here. For every value of t, I will get a different integral. For every value of t I put in, I will get a different number out. This something is a function of t. And this something is my new multiplication. This is called legally the convolution of F and G. So formal notation looks like this. I don't know what color, let's bring another color in here. F of T 
convoluted with g of t is defined to be the integral from zero to t of f of t minus u g of u du. So we, and we're approaching the end of time today, so we we'll make a final, few final comments and then we'll see how we're going. Have I invented a new multiplication? Well, possibly. I certainly will get a new function value. Every time I plug in a T, I get a number out. So it's a kind of a multiplication. It's kind of a mixing of F and G. How is the word convoluted? used in English. It's not a perfect example, but you know, he gave a convoluted presentation. That means the presentation was all mixed up, right? Well, this is kind of a way of mixing up F and G. In fact, if you look at it, when you start at zero for the variable U, it'll be T and zero here. And what you're doing is you're kind of mixing the values of F going one way and the values of G going the other way. You are convoluting or mixing up the values of F and G in a funny way. Now remember what we said back up here. Is there another multiplication I could invent instead? I have invented a multiplication that now makes this sentence true by the definition, by the work we did. The next question was, does this multiplication have any value or is it just a silly game dreamed up by math professors? So this is a new multiplication. And in fact, this new multiplication combined with the Laplace transform, in fact, it was invented to work with the Laplace transform, will now solve problems that we could not solve before. Now you're welcome to look at the homework problem from 6-4 tonight. In fact, I encourage you to do it even though it's not due till Thursday because the examples I give you in 6-4 show you how this convolution is valuable. It's just a stupid game, unless it does something useful for us. But the recommended problems in 6.4, I'm sorry, 6.5, I work out several examples where I show you doing it something useful for you. Now, maybe you don't recognize exactly what it's doing for you at that moment. I understand that. That's why the homework problem is not due till tomorrow night. But this multiplication actually turns out to be crazily successful. Like the dot product that you once thought was just dumb, you know, like, and, and forever you were screwing up the dot product. Why? Because you didn't respect it. Once you started to respect what the dot product did for you, I don't think you made too many errors doing dot products, right? Once you had to take it to your physics class, once you had to take it to your engineering class, same with the cross product. Now this looks like a crazy, silly multiplication. What is the meaning of this? I will show you very good physical meaning next time. But all we have to do right now is say, first of all, this is legal and promise to be fulfilled later. It allows me to do things, very valuable new things that I could not do otherwise. Okay, that's probably a good place to cut it off. And I'll bring you some practical examples next time. But you can do your problem from 6-3 tonight. 
I don't think the problem from 6.3 is as nasty as the one we tried to do at the beginning of the hour. Uh, but it's a similar problem that involves a lot of constant juggling or involves some constant juggling. Uh, tomorrow, we'll do some examples and I will show you how crazily useful this is. In fact, uh, for those of you who are looking ahead, this is what is the foundation of what people call control systems. Standard engineering course in junior, senior level. Okay, you guys have a nice day. I'll hang out for a second if you want to ask a question. I'll investigate the map.